Hi everybody, it's Professor Miller. This lecture is going to focus on adaptive immunity. Um, the previous lecture was on the innate immune system and an inflammatory response, which is the first component of our immune system. So this section will focus on um, the adaptive response where we develop antibodies um, essentially against organisms. Um, so the adaptive immune system, the main purpose obviously is destruction of infectious microorganisms. Um, that are really resistant to that initial inflammatory response or innate response. The key difference with adaptive immunity is that, number one, it's inducible, and number two, it's very specific. So each, basically each T and B cell will recognize that one antigen um, and develop, you know, an antibody against it. However, when you look at it from, you know, a broad perspective, obviously you have, you know, multiple B and T cells that can, you know, recognize a host of foreign antigens. Um, you know, these concepts play into things like immunization and prevention of, of infectious disease, essentially. Um, it does have a very long-lasting impact, um, has memory, so it's long-term protection. Whereas your innate response is very quick um, and more of that um, brief initial response that is not long-lived. This is just an example. I added a table comparing the two. Humoral basically can be the same thing as adaptive. They have different, you know, sometimes you call it that. But once again, your humoral response or adaptive immunity essentially is developing antibodies against these antigens. Um, and your, you know, your B cells differentiate, um, and then they also have antibodies that are developed from it. So it's more long lasting um, and more specific. And you can go ahead and read, you know, the other side on cell mediated immunity. I just added these charts because I felt like it was a good way of looking at it. Once again, comparing the two cell mediated versus antibody mediated. Once again, you have, you know, it just shows the levels of like you have, you know, virgin cytotoxic T cells or virgin helper T cells and they differentiate into, you know, effector T cells, memory T cells. And obviously it directly kills, you know, the microorganism essentially there. Whereas the antibody, you know, B response formulates from your B cells. And you essentially have the memory B cells, effector B cells that produce antibodies. And once again, it destroys antigens as well, but you have long-lasting immunity with it. So I just essentially added these, you know, just to take a look at. There's different elements of your adaptive immune system. Obviously, you have antigens, which are any foreign sub, uh, substance, essentially, like your microorganisms, such as bacteria or viruses. Um, and other elements, obviously, are your T cells and B cells, your lymphocytes, that um, formulate this adaptive immune response. Different components, um, when we, you know, look at the term humoral, um, essentially that's linked with immunoglobulins or antibodies. And we'll discuss these as we move through the lecture. There's a few important ones that you really want to make sure you understand and know what they essentially are linked with and how to interpret them. Um, but essentially, overall, in general, these antibodies bind to antigens on bacteria and viruses. And that's exactly the, me the mechanism behind, you know, destroying the bacteria or viruses, essentially. And then you have cellular T cells. They, they do have memory as well, but these are more of a direct target. They don't have, um, they don't produce antibodies, essentially, with it. They do produce memory, so they still could recognize that other cell. Um, so it does kind of give you a longer lasting immune response, essentially, with the T cells there, too. They both interact, and your adaptive immune system interacts with your innate immune system. Um, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, your innate immune system is kind of what triggers the adaptive response, and they work together, essentially, you know, as a whole. Clonal diversity and selection, I figure i go through this really quick. Um, it's really about the production of, you know, T and B cells and how they... Um, diversify essentially and they kind of transform into different areas like memory B cells, um, plasma cells, etc. Um, but with clonal diversity, I felt like it was good to put a table with this. It's just easier to look at it when you look at it with a picture. T cells are always produced, well they're both originally produced in your bone marrow, but then you know you have your primary or central lymphoid organs, your thymus and your bone marrow once again. Your T cells basically are what um, essentially develop in your thymus. Your B cells always develop in your bone marrow. I always remember it T and T, B and B. However, they're still like undifferentiated T or B cells. So once they are out of, you know, your thymus and bone marrow, that's when they're, you know, in your secondary lymph organs, which I'll show you an image on the next side. You know, it's like your lymphatic system. 
this is actually when they start to diversify and this is when they become specific to like a particular antigen or um, essentially it's what we call clonal selection. So that's when they develop the receptors for like a specific antigen. So it's just kind of a process from left to right of like how they're basically very undifferentiated or developed in the bone marrow and then moving forward and become differentiated. And they work together again, like with your, you know, cellular immune response and your humoral re immunity. Remember I mentioned about dendritic, uh, dendritic cells and the antigen presenting cells. That's another thing that kind of triggers them to develop, um, you know, a specific receptor for an antigen essentially, or an antibody for an antigen. Um, so it's just kind of, I don't expect you to memorize this. It's essentially to put it together so you understand how it kind of progresses. So once again, you have, you know, clonal diversity, like I just mentioned, takes place um, mainly as it goes out to your peripheral lymph tissues. That's where it kind of transitions over. But you have the central, obviously, which is your bone marrow and thymus. Peripheral are located all over your body, obviously, like you have in your tonsils, your adenoids, um, your spleen, things like that. Those are all considered peripheral. Um, the only ones that are central are, cent are your uh, bone marrow and your thymus. So that's where they're originating, you know, developing, essentially. I added this image too. It's kind of very similar to what I was just mentioning, um, just showing like the APC and antigen presentation. So obviously you have like an immature T cell like up on this top left. Um, and that differentiates. So you can have like cytotoxic T cells, which directly kill them. Or, you know, you have your, um, your helper T cell essentially. And, and once again, it's bactericidal again. But this is actually what stimulates B cells. So your T cells and B cells actually really work together, and that's what's stimulating activation of B cells. B cells are the ones that are actually producing the antibodies, you know, when we talk about an antibody towards a microorganism. And they develop, you know, specific antibodies for a particular antigen. So really what it does, like if you read down here, um, it's essentially flagging them, and it'll, you know, attract to that certain antigen, and essentially that's what triggers, um, like, your complement system or phagocytosis. And you know, that's what essentially is ridding your body of these pathogens. Once again, this is just an example, like a B cell receptor encounters a matching antigen and antigens is, is ingested. So that's just like, remember, you have a future response as well. So as soon as you have that original response, you have these antibodies that are developed. And then like the second time you're exposed to it, you have that antibody on board. So it's going to automatically directly attack those um, antigens, essentially. So that's why it's got that long lasting immune response. When we look at of adaptive immunity, there's different mechanisms as to how it occurs, essentially. We can have active immunity or passive immunity. Um, and I'm sure you probably have read about this before, but, um, you know, when you have active immunity, you have exposure to the antigen, whether it's an infection. So let's just say measles, for instance, like, you know, infected with measles, that would be an active exposure to the antigen. And you develop antibodies or T cells or both, you know, produced after the natural exposure to the antigen. Um, so one, you can get it from an active component is getting it from an infection or the other way that we often do it is through immunization. Um, so they're exposed to a minute amount of it and then they develop antibodies against, you know, the immunization. And that's another reason why too we give boosters because sometimes it's meant to um, boost the antibody response against, you know, that antigen. You know, one shot might not necessarily be enough to have lasting immunity. That's why we do booster shots and stuff, it, depending on the vaccine. But And it's long-lived, so, you know, there's, you know, it's effective for long-term um, immunity. Whereas you have passive immunity, passive means exactly passive. It could be pre, uh, preformed antibodies or T-cells that are administered. A good example would be like IVIG or immune globulin. Like if, for instance, going back to measles, when you were looking at people that can't get the measles vaccine and they were exposed or at risk for developing measles, they, you know, and they can't have the vaccine, you know, they can give immune globulin for measles. So that would be like an example of preformed antibodies um, or like an IVIG. We're giving them immune globulins, you know, to basically combat, hopefully hasten an infection. Another example of passive immunity is one that we probably all heard of too, is like maternal antibodies to so the fetus, one through the placenta, two through breast milk. Um, but these are temporary, so these are not, they aren't developing antibodies within their own body. These are just temporary. They're getting antibodies from the mom, or you're getting immune globulin from, you know, a medical intervention. So it's temporary. It's not long-lasting because these are not self-driven 
um, antibodies, if that makes sense. On the right, too, same thing. They have, you know, adaptive immune, naturally acquired, or artificial, so passive, active. Um, and it's pretty much the same exact um, examples that I gave you as well. In terms of an antigen, I'm sure you know what an antigen is, but um, it's any molecule that can react or be recognized by the immune system. Problem is, is that, um, and we'll get into this when we get into abnormals, is that sometimes the immune system goes haywire and, you know, you have the direct target of self, essentially, or you, your body perceives, you know, your own cells as an antigen, essentially. So that's where we develop, like, autoimmune disorders and um, things such as that. Um, but typically, the normal response is against pathogens, whether it's bacteria, virus, fungus, etc. However, an antigen, too, when you think of allergies, and we'll talk about this once we get into abnormals, but hypersensitivity reactions, and there's different types, and we'll go through them. But you think of like an, a, um, you know, an anaphylactic reaction with like a, um, you know, insect bite or peanuts. Um, you know, obviously, it's recognized as, as an antigen. So your body performs a response against it. And that's where you're getting, you know, like a hypersensitivity reaction to. Obviously, you can have foods that you are, you know, your body thinks are an antigen. Um, tissues or blood products, like so obviously like a transplant rejection. Um, blood products, same type of thing, because your body um, looks at like that those HLA markers on there, and it recognizes it as non-self, and then it's you know basically inter interpreted as an antigen. Um, so another factor too, antigens versus immunogens. Immunogens are basically anything that can trigger this response. So you can have an antigen, but it might not be an immunogen. A lot of antigens can be an immunogen, but <laughs> if that makes sense, but Basically, it's considered an immunogen when it can have an immune response. So any type of antigen that can do that. This you can go out and take a look at and just expand if you want to read the bottom. But the answer is B, passive. Antibodies are really important to understand. Um, they're also called immunoglobulins. And once we get into abnormals, there's, you know, patients can have deficiencies in immunoglobulins. Um, you know, they may be, may be deficient in an IgG. And I've seen that before. And um, we'll talk about that with the abnormals. But... Basically, they're produced by plasma cells in response to an immunogen, um, but you normally have multiple classes of different antibodies. Um, the big ones that you definitely will hear a lot about is IgG and IgM. IgE is another one you'll definitely hear about because you see that a lot with um, IgE-mediated um, hypersensitivity reactions. And IgA is another one, and that's usually through um, bodily fluids, essentially. They can be characterized by antigenetic, or antigenic um, structural, and functional differences. I have a chart that I'll go through in a minute. It's on a different slide. Um, in terms of antigen pre presentation, I think I mentioned this in the first one. You have, you know, they're called APCs. Um, dendritic cells are often, you know, the APCs that are presenting the antigen, essentially, to your adaptive immune system. Everybody has um, major histocompatibility complexes, and a lot of times these are found on like your cells throughout the body or your tissues, and also even on components of your um, white cells and stuff like that too. Um, same thing with HLAs. It's another marker that's very um, genetic, essentially. And I'll explain it to you when we go to the next slide. Um, it makes more sense when you talk about it in terms of like a transplant reje rejection. Um, there's different MHC class molecules, so there's different... Each individual or each individual um, cell has different classes, essentially, or MHC classes. And I don't expect you to memorize all these by any means. Um, but typically, like, the class 1 will have an interaction with, like, your cell-mediated response. Class 2 typically is more related to an antibody-mediated response. And this becomes really important, too, when you're looking at, like, transplants um, or even, like, infusions or blood products and stuff like that, too. Um, so cells transplanted, um, or I'm sorry, cells and transplanted tissue from one individual have a different set of um, major histocompatibility complexes, surface antigens, then those of the recipient. So this is exactly what poses a problem when you can have an immune response against that foreign MHC, essentially. So it's marking it as an abnormal. It's non-self, so you can have, obviously, transplant rejection. And it's the same kind of concept, too, when you think about blood products. Um, a haplotype, essentially, the reason that this stuff is important, too, like this would be if you worked with like a lot of transplant patients. Um, the haplotype is basically when you're 
getting these alleles from your parents. So you get two from, it's actually, you get three sets of them, but it's genetic. It's kind of like those basic genetic concepts, but you get it from your mom and you get it from your, your paternal and maternal side and you have alleles and same thing. So the closer the family member, for instance, for a tramp transplant, whether, you know, they always would screen like the family, you know, the closest family members, like a sibling, you know, they would check to see if they have the same haplotype as, you know, the, the recipient essentially. And that's why they do tissue typing. It's basically to look at these alleles and make sure that they are accurate or that they match. Um, the more common they are, the more similar, the more likely it's going to be successful because obviously you're not going to amount a self or an antigen against that tissue. Um, this is pretty detailed. This would be if you worked like in this area, obviously, but um, I just figured I'd leave it in there and discuss with you about it a little bit. Because essentially, this is how transplant, you know, rejections occur. Um, but when we look at specific antibodies, you know, immunoglobulins, what, like I said, IgG is usually the most abundant. Um, so that's the one that you're going to find the most. Um, this one you will definitely have, um, you'll be looking at a lot with like titers or if you're looking for an infection. We utilize, you know, IgG and IgM to look at, um, you know, like if they have Epstein-Barr, if they're in an exposure, you you know, you're considering that as a potential diagnosis, we'll look at their levels of IgG and IgM. So those are the two that we tend to look at a lot, and I'll explain to you more as we move through. IgA is more found in your secretary, secretory um, or secretions, like sometimes you'll find it in breast milk, um, and I have more on further slides that we'll go through too. IgE is um, heavily associated with allergies, um, so you, you know, elevated IgE, with allergic reactions. Um, it's definitely correlated with that. Um, so like when we look at like um, anaphylaxis, you'll hear that as an IgE mediated allergy. And when we say that with IgE, you know, that they're at risk for anaphylaxis essentially. And we'll talk about that too as we move through. IgD, you don't hear as much with this, um, but it signals B cells to activate and then IgM. So it's intertwined with that as well made by B lymphocytes. So these are what they're making B lymphocytes. When you think back to it, they're making the um, antibodies, essentially. I don't expect you to memorize the structure of these, obviously. Um, I just added this on there because, once again, like the, the one that's um, – that um, the total percentage of antibody in the serum is IgG. So that's the most prominent one. Um, and then IgA, that's another one that you'll see. And I just wanted to add that, too, because IgG, if you look on here, it crosses the placenta. So, you know, maternal antibodies from IgG goes to the baby. Um, but IgG, and I'll explain it in a minute, but IgG, remember, is, um, I'll, I'll wait to explain it, actually. These are just different types of functions, um, and essentially in the end of how, you know, it will rid the body of bacteria or an antigen, essentially, like that, or a virus. Um, I don't expect you to memorize all these types of functions down there. I just There's a few concepts that I want to make sure you get. When we look at, you know, antibodies, we'll look at a primary and secondary response. So your primary response, obviously, is your initial exposure. When you look at an initial exposure, what happens is that you will have a rise in the IgM antibodies. So that will be more of a recent um, infection. IgG... With that first infection, if you look at this chart over here on the right, that's the one where you're developing antibodies against that um, virus or whatever it may be that they're exposed to. It takes a little bit longer for it to rise. So I always remember as IgG means gone. If you have an elevated IgG that is um, high and their IgM is low, that would mean that they're not actively infected. And I'll give you some more examples. If their IgM is high, but their IgG is kind of getting a little bit higher. That means they have like a new recent exposure. If you see over here, they're at the secondary response. Remember, when you have a secondary response, you already have those antibodies on board with IgG. So what happens is, you know, you get exposed again. Automatically, the IgG is going to kick right in. And you actually will develop more IgG antibodies against that, you know, virus or whatever it may be. And hopefully, you won't have, you know, those symptoms essentially, with the, with the infection. Um, so basically, you have a, they're not differentiating anymore. So that's why you end up with a quick secondary response, or I'm sorry, a quick IgG rise that second time. 
where the first time you, they has to differentiate and make these antibodies. So the IgG is a little bit slower to, you know, go up essentially. But we check these in titers, remember. So like even if you're getting checked to see if you've, you know, been exposed to varicella or you have varicella, you're looking for IgG. IgG means gone and it should be elevated. You want to have those antibodies present. Um, IgM, if you're suspicious of someone having an infection, we always will look at that. If their IgM is high, they, mo they might, I mean, potentially, you got to look at everything, but they potentially could have an infection because those are the ones that mount essentially right with a recent exposure. Um, so those are kind of like important concepts that you should understand. Um, once again, that secondary response is rapid, more rapid, because you're making more antibodies. So you're going to get a quicker, you already have antibodies on board, and you're going to get a quicker response. Um, and it's because you have those memory cells already um, there, and they don't really have to differentiate. So the process is already beginning. Um, IgM is produced in similar qu quantities to the primary response, but IgG is produced in greater numbers. Um, prolonged and protective secondary immune response explains how vaccines provide protection against certain pathog pathogens. And it also explains, remember how I brought up of um, doing booster shots. That's exactly why, because that second time you give it, you're going to get even more antibodies. You get better protection essentially with it. Or, you know, um, it wanes over time and you have to give them a booster. Where IgM, and don't worry about like a J chain. You don't need to know that. You don't need to memorize that. That's the first antibody that's produced during the primary response to an antigen. So that's going to be that first exposure to the antigen that you're going to get the IgM. So usually that's more of an active acute infection that you'll see IgM rise. I already went through IgG. There's different classes and I don't expect you to memorize all these either. Um, the big thing is it's transported across the placenta. So that gives the baby relative immunity. So whatever the mom's immune to or, you know, like you had, um, even if the mom's given like vaccines or something, you know, during pregnancy, it does help give protection to the baby. And then even after they're born, those levels of IgG in the baby are still present. They do wane over time. So that's why during that first few months of life, they actually have more protection from the mom, from maternal antibodies. And the same thing, even IgA is secreted in breast milk. So they get that through mom too. And we'll talk about that as we move through. But just remember, IgG means gone. IgM is active. This is an example of like primary and secondary responses to tetanus and diphtheria. I just It's the same thing that I kind of mentioned. However, certain, um, like for this, for instance, if you give this vaccine, you know, they may have exposure to it, like whether it's a another immunization, not even necessarily exposure. Let's say they're immunized here and immunized here. They may not, obviously, are not going to have an active infection. They're just going to get the IgG rise from it. So that's just an example of, like, if you gave them, you know, a vaccine at that point. And once again, look how much the secondary response rises for IgG. This I added because I thought it was a good example um, for rubella. Um, once again, if you have, um, like, if you look at the numbers of when they had, you know, an infection, it takes a little bit for you know, that IgG to rise. So you're not, you might, if you did it right away, you're not going to really necessarily get a high number. You might not get one. You would have to recheck it. Um, but, you know, it takes a few days. So that's another thing. Even, you know, if you do it with, on that first day, you might not have a rise there. You know, that peak takes a few days. It does disappear. So once again, after that infection clears, if you were to check this patient later down the road at, you know, uh, I don't know if this is month, six months, their IgM should be no, it should be back to normal, and their IG, IgG will be high. Um, so basically, like I said, your IgM should drop. It's going to be high with active infection. It's going to drop with no infection, but your IgG should stay high. Um, so I just thought I'd add these. It was just kind of a good thing to look at, and then too, like negative IgM. and IgE, if you have negative for both of them, that means they have never had an infection. They've never had an exposure, so they don't have antibodies. If they have a negative IgM and a positive IgG, it indicates immunity. So I thought it was just a good chart to look at. This was another one. I was going to add it. I didn't want to confuse it, but you can look at antib other antibodies too. But like if you just look at the IgG and IgM, it just gives you an example of kind of like what I just went through with, with um, rubella. Like if they have... Um, a positive IgG and a negative IgM, it just means that they had a past infection and they're immune to it. 
So it's the same example, pretty much like I gave you with the rubella one. In terms of IgA, um, the important part of this is actually secreted in things like breast milk. So once again, to baby, um, you know, the baby will get antibodies from the mom. Um, what other, it's, you know, it's also in your lymphoid tissues um, that protect external surfaces. So it's basically more of um, those, your sweat, your tears, your mucus, etc. There's small amounts of IgG and IgM, but IgA is pretty much the dominant one. Um, IgE, once again, I mentioned at the beginning, this is heavily linked with allergies. So when you hear IgE-mediated allergy, that's a severe allergy. Those are things like anaphylaxis. And we'll talk about this as we get into allergies, but there's a key difference between an, a true allergy and an intolerance. You know, like you think about foods or lactose, it may be intolerant, but they don't have an allergy. But IgE-mediated allergies are, you know, severe allergies, and that they're at risk for anaphylaxis with that, you know, a systemic response with it. And I'll talk to you about that as we move into um, abnormals, and I'll put up a couple journal articles on it. I just find that reading articles, too, like just different perspectives kind of helps put it in, um, helps you remember it, essentially. Um, it's least concentrated, but once again, um, very common in allergic responses. And some of the portions are bound to mast cells. When you think back to mast cells, you think of all that histamine release, and that's exactly with that, you know, that inflammatory response as well. Um, IgD has very limited functions, low concentration in the blood. Um, it's basically on the surface of uh, B lymphocytes. So the ones that I really make sure you absolutely know, IgG, IgM, Wait, I said IgG, IgM, IgA, IgE. So those four are the, like, I mean, the three for sure you have to make sure you understand. Um, with clonal diversity, I already kind of talked about this. I don't know. I must have repeated this somehow in here. Um, um, it does primarily occur in the fetus. So a lot of this at the very beginning, they're already developed. Um, when I talked about, like, with the bone marrow and the thymus and all that, um, I kind of talked, I, I must have repeated this somehow in my slides. Um, same kind of things, clonal, clonal selection, I know I already talked about at the beginning, um, primarily at birth, um, but it is initiated by antigens, and I kind of already talked about that too. Um, in terms of B cell activation, um, this is when they become more specific. Um, it takes place in the central lymphoid or primary lymphoid organs. It results in immature but immunocompetent T and B cells. So I already kind of talked about this too. If you look back at this chart, it's just basically you know, they become differentiated as it goes further out into the peripheral lymph, lymph system, essentially. Um, antibody class switch, these are just some general notes you can take a look at. Um, but obviously with clonal selection where they differentiate, this is where they can change that class of antibodies. That's why the only thing I really wanted to point out um, in terms of being IgG, IgA, IgE, etc. Um, so they get, you know, through clonal selection, that's how these antibodies essentially or immunoglobulins develop. In terms of antibodies, and I already mentioned, this is essentially how um, they directly attack the antigen. And I don't expect you to memorize all these, you know, exactly the terms here. It just, so you essentially understand what happens. You know, these are just different mechanisms of them um, binding to the antigen and ridding, or essentially destroying that antigen. Um, a little bit more on or fetal and neonatal immunity. Um, the big thing is to remember that babies are very immunocompetent. Uh, and immunocompetent. Um, you know, their immune system is not well developed at this point in time. They are capable of, you know, amounting a primary IgM response, but they're unable to produce an IgG challenge. And actually, it makes sense if you think about when we give immunizations. You know, we may give some a little bit earlier, but a lot of them are given, you know, six months, four to six months. You know, we, we don't do it immediately at birth. And it's really to kind of give them a chance to be able to, you know, have these mechanisms in place. Because this function is truly deficient when they're born, especially like at that, you know, neonatal age. So they have, you know, deficient antibody production, even their, you know, innate immune system, like your phagocytic activity, your complement activity can be deficient as well, or it's not fully functioning as an adult would, obviously. Um, but once again, you have good protection from the mom. And actually, during that first few months of life, they actually have really pretty good protection from mom because you have those maternal antibodies on board. It's usually right around that four to six month mark that these start to drop, like your mom's or maternal IgG. That's actually when they're more susceptible to developing infections. Um, but you note that they're, if you look at that chart at the top, they're, the child's IgG tends to rise right around that time too. And that's actually the time when we start giving an, um, immunizations because they do start having more IgG on board and they can actually mount a response for long-lasting immunity.
so the big thing, obviously, just realizing that they are immunocompetent, essentially. Um, it does take a little bit of time, but they have more protection for mom with that. Um, in terms of the older adult, and I know we talked about this before, but they have decreased T-cell activity. Um, their thymic size is 15% of its maximum size. So there's like an overall decrease in immune function here. There's a decrease in antibody response to antigens and overall production of specific antibodies. So they just don't have a great immune response anymore. Um, there's an increased circulating of autoantibodies, so they're more at risk for, um, you know, attacking self, essentially, and having more risk for autoimmune disorders. Um, there's a decrease in circulating memory B cells, so they don't have a good response, you know, to an antigen that presents again. Um, so obviously their immune function declines with the older adult. Um, so next we'll move on to, like, the abnormals, and I'll kind of put some of this in perspective and pull it together a little bit more. Um, if you have questions on this, please let me know, though. Thank you.